what happened that night was the um, the dev group component uh, was offset several kilometers away and would walk in once they were more or less in and on the target. The uh, range element was to land on the target. Um, when I say on the target, within 100 meters. And the target had basically been wrapped up. And just as um, I'm getting on, I just happened to be one of the last on, basically the sky lit up with um, you know, medium and heavy machine gun traces coming over those top of those blades and those arcs were like almost interlocked um and from an operator perspective you know there's no other word for it straight away i was just like oh like yeah this is not good welcome to combat story i'm ryan fugit and i serve warzone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and cia officer over a 15-year career i'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat on this show i interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Wes H. Hennessy, a retired Australian Special Forces commando and 20-year veteran who deployed on numerous occasions to Afghanistan, Iraq, East Timor, Somalia, just to name a few. He fought for years at the upper echelons of the Australian Special Operations community and was on joint operations with US equivalents like DevGru and Critical Missions. He was later recognized with two U.S. Bronze Star medals, one with Valor, for his efforts, in addition to the coveted Australian Conspicuous Service Medal. Since leaving the military, Wes has gone on to become a sought-after brand ambassador, public speaker, and, most importantly, veteran advocate in Australia. He stands out from the crowd with a down-to-earth, honest, and truth-to-power personality, and I hope you enjoy his combat story as much as I did. H, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you. Really good to be on, Ryan. So I, I want to start out for the uh, for the American audience here, which is the preponderance of who ends up watching Combat Story. I just want to I want to get a sense of where you grew up in Australia. I understand it's Queensland, um, and I want to see if you might be able to ground us a little bit with what. Uh, as you grow up in Queensland, what state in the U.S. or region of the U.S. does that most resemble? Just so we can get a frame of reference as we dive into who you are and how you grew up. Yeah, okay, cool. So um, a few things on Australia, first of all, because I've worked a lot in the U.S. and worked for several U.S. companies. So as I used to say to them, to give them some perspective, and then let's just do rough numbers. Um, you got 300 million people. We've got 30 million, but we're not that much smaller than you. So uh, most of this country is, is um, you know, quite uninhabited and quite, quite remote. Um, so the part of the country I spent most of my time on um, is in Queensland, Australia, other than when I served in a unit, but I was born in Queensland. Um, also to note, before I drill down in the second part of that question is our states are, are massive compared to yours. So. You know, if Australia was to have state sizes the size of the US, we'd probably be, I don't know, somewhere around a 30-state country, if that makes sense. And I know a lot of your states are quite varying in size, but you get my point there. Um, so we only have the several states and territories. Um, so Queensland is a big state in the, um, in the uh, northeast um, component of Australia. Um, so as you're looking at Australia at the top right-hand corner, um, how would you describe it? So we've got no mountain mountains here. Um, so it's certainly not like that, but, you know, it's a lot of cattle country. It's hot. It's dry. So it'd probably be a cross between, you know, Texas and um, what would that be Arizona or something maybe. Um, you know, so in the far west, it's almost desolate. Um, and like I said, the, the primary industry here, um, you know, would be mining, um, you know, a lot of big military bases and um and agricultural you know and primarily with that you know cattle and cropping and stuff so i call it god's country <laughs> got it it sounds a lot like texas here then i love it yeah. so, so please fact check me on this but i i just want to ask because i came across this when doing some research what is a banana bender in queensland <laughs> i i think that's open to many different interpretations yeah, let's keep it. Let's keep it PG rated here, huh? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it could, it could be a good night out, uh, or or it could be something else. Um, 
But it's just, I think Queensland is because uh, one thing I failed to mention is a large component of the state is quite, quite tropical. Um, so the only jungle warfare training from the military aspect um, side is here in Queensland out of all of Australia. Um, so that's probably another key point to um, dial in the listeners a little bit. Um, and, and because of those tropical areas, those uh, that would know anything about anything to do with growing certain fruits um, or growing certain um, fruits and vegetables, um, it needs that really tropical environment with high rainfall. Um, so that's some distinct areas and zones of Queensland. But um, yeah, bananas. There's a lot of bananas here. <laughs> That was a that was a random question, right? That was a good. One. That was one for the notebook. So look, I just had I, I was I came across it when I was looking up Queensland, so uh, I was curious. Um, and then just before we dive into you growing up in that area, I wanted to set the stage because I know the the unit you end up going to, the commandos, I think is less familiar to many folks in the U.S. than SAS or SASR. If we could just briefly at the at the outset here talk about kind of that difference between what we perceive as SAS and the commando regiments, um, what do they associate with most closely maybe on the U.S. side and, the, and that mission set? And then we're going to dive into you growing up there. Yeah, sure. So um, this, it's a harder question to answer with, um, with America. Because I'm, I'm very familiar with um, the American um, different elements and tiers uh, and services and et cetera, et cetera, of the special forces and special operations and other elements. Um, so we don't have tier systems. They're colloquially used. Um, it's, it's, it's probably more aligned to, you know, if you look at SBS and 2-2, you know, you look at 2 Commando and SASR. Um, 2 Commando and SASR uh, had a very rough start together because SASR, was the only special forces unit in Australia other than a reserve unit, which wasn't online and we'll just, we'll just park them. They've come a long way, but I'll just put them aside not to confuse anyone. Um, so if you can imagine um, that in the US, you only had your know, CAG or dev group, um, and then next minute they raised the second unit. So, so there was so much inter-unit rivalry um, and it got to quite an unhealthy state as the units uh, ability to operate together because it became a little bit inhospitable to say the least. And it's just, um, it was a sad natural component that we had to go through. Um, you know, you get some extremely strong personalities um, who are operating in that environment. So, yeah. But, um, you know, that, that through, through the intensive operational um, service that we all saw post 9-11, that sort of eyed itself out towards the back of that. And there's a lot more mutual uh, respect and it became more of a healthy rivalry. Um, and to be fair, you know, we had so much to go. I mean, the, uh, the Australian Special Air Service Regiment, you know, has got a, quite a long history. Um, whereas, you know, we had no history. Um, so we were just, I guess we were just probably fortunate that we were only raised a few years before 9-11 because that saw you know, an acceleration bell curve um, in regards to skills, capabilities, experience, equipment, everything, like everything did after 9-11 for everyone around the world, really. But that really put us where we needed to be in a short space of time. Um, so in regards to mission sets, and, and obviously, in my opinion, some might view it as slightly biased because, you know, that's where I spent, um, you know, all my time. However, you did uh, a couple of secondments to SSR and um, courses and stuff with them and worked extensively with them over the years. But to use parallels, you know, like that were earlier used, um, we don't subscribe to. And those parallels would be, you know, we're like the Ranger Regiment of Australia. And those statements were said back when the Ranger Regiment was still, um, well, I know how much it's developed, you know, in the last couple of decades. So um, hopefully that uh, all makes a little bit of, bit of sense. But, you know, as far as the government's concerned, um, you know, we've got a national counterterrorism capability resides inside that unit, uh, which is in the East Coast, which is the highest threat area of Australia. Um, so they entrusted us to do that. And the mission sets, uh, if you were to look at a spectrum of the mission sets, there's a component here within SASR, you know, that we don't do where they're pushing more so into those grey roles. So um, uh, roles and tasks with other government agencies, and we'll leave that at that. Um, whereas uh, two commando uh, doesn't do those roles, 
Um, so it's it's more of a you know combat direct action. Um, there are a lot of other roles and some unique roles, but if you look at it more like that, and they can work all the way down to you know um, smallest numbers, you know individuals or pairs, but generally you know they're teams, platoon slash troop level. Um, and then when business is serious, um, you know it's more you know those uh, companies or in your terms or in certain units terms squadron minuses, but we use the term company in that unit. Um, and nowadays, very much like most units around the world, um, we're tailored to task. Um, so then a task force is created as opposed to a unit or an element of the unit deploying, um, you know, and whether that's called a, you know, a task force and given a number, like a lot of uh, the times yours are, or SOTG, Special Operations Task Group, and they'll give that a number and then deploy that because we need, um, as I said, exactly uh, like, because uh, um, I have extensive experience with, experience with the US units, um, pulling in, um, you know, PJs, pulling in, um, you know, a couple of platoons of um, rangers with a, you know, a CAG uh, element or a um, dev group element, um, and then some other government agencies um, and, and liaison people to achieve whatever the mission is. So in regards to that way, we're, we're a lot more fused and um, synced up now. Perfect. And the reason I wanted to ask, I mean, I think it sets the stage for a lot of this, but you, you, as you mentioned, you grew up in that commando environment, right? I mean, you worked with all these other units, but you, you were kind of brought up in that space. So as we go back to you as a kid, from what I've read, you kind of had your sights set at a young age. I'm going in the military. I want to go into the special ops community. And I would have thought that SAS is kind of that place you would go. Could you just talk to me about when you started getting this feeling of, Hey, I, this is the direction I want. I want to be in the military one day. Yeah, and that, that's um, a question I get asked a bit, and the answers, you know, I, I still always smile when I say it, Ryan. I, from when, as early as I can literally remember, um, I was. Um, that's all I had my mind set on. So I mean, my earliest thoughts, as in those first years of school, when people would say, "What are you going to do?" I'm like, "I'm going to join the army," um, and more so, or, or further extent. I would say that I'm going to, you know, be special forces and I would use, you know, case things when other special forces units weren't known about or movie role models, even though now we've uh, got a lot of experience in the real world, we mightn't use those role models, you know, like, you know, I want to be like Rambo or I want to do this, um, you know, thinking that one guy saves the world. Um, but that's, you know, those things that, you know, you grew up watching and seeing and, you um, for whatever reason they uh, aspired me or inspired me. I didn't have any direct family members. My grandfather um, had some time in service, um, but certainly, you know, not my father or uncles or anything like that or, or anyone else in the family for that matter. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where it came from, um, but it was distinct. It never changed course. Um, and the f earliest you can apply in Australia is 15 years old. And at 15 years old, I applied. You had to apply um, as a technical trade then, so basically to go to school. So I applied to do that, and I didn't get accepted. I can't remember the details. So I was going to come in as a mechanic or do some electrical stuff to then transfer across just to get in sooner and get more experience. Um, and that didn't work out. So as soon as I was eligible, which – I think in Australia at the time is um, when you're 16 and a half, you can apply. So the earliest you can join, you must have turned the age of 17 before you can sign the line. Um, and then, um, yeah, so at 16 and a half, literally on the day, uh, I filled out that application and then I was 17 years old in a few weeks and the letter came through and I was gone. So, um, yeah, very, uh, that's, it's very focused on it. Um, and like I said, I don't really know where it came from, but yeah, there's a few jokes yeah, that I've said on other podcasts, which I can remember clearly. They're not stories I've made up of, you know, using my ruler in the classroom and getting reprimanded, you know, as a gun and maneuvering around, you know, between the other students, basically distracting them and teachers just tearing their hair out and, you know, letters getting written home to mum as, you know, what's wrong with this boy? Why is he so obsessed with military tactics and stuff? So lucky there was no active shooters back then. I probably would have got put in some care somewhere <laughs> this kid's not right anybody in the family trying to stop you from doing that yeah so we all have different upbringings um etc with our um parents but um you know my parents 
you know, certainly they kind of just shoulder shrugged it, I guess, when, when I said that I was going to do it and it wasn't until later, um, you know, that because I returned home because I'd gone out into the, the far west here, which is the equivalent of um, like working on a ranch in America remotely. And the letter came through, so I had to travel back home. So I wasn't even living at home then. I left home basically as soon as I could. Um, and when I went back home, and there was no mobile phones or anything back then, so you just kind of arrive at home. And then uh, when I arrived at home, you know, I was like, oh, I'm just here to pick up my things. Like, my letters come through, I'm joining the army. But then mum broke down. She was quite upset. Um, and she was with, um, you know, my stepfather at that time. Um, you know, I... I I think he was, you know, relatively happy and proud of it all, but yeah, but yeah, that's how that all went down. Not asked this question before, and I'm asking it because somebody wrote in to me, and it was a mother of someone who's in uh, CAG now, and I, there are not many women who listen to this podcast, but she wrote in and said, "Hey, would you please ask people how they managed with their mothers when they go down these paths to the special ops world?" So you mentioned your mom kind of breaks down crying. How how did that work over time? With I mean, you have seen some action. How did you manage that with your mom? To to be uh, I shouldn't prefix it to be honest because everything's honest. But um, look, look looking back, I I I I, I would say I didn't handle um, certain things well when I. And I've had a lot of time to do this now, and, and there's a lot of things that I had to go back over and uh, review, so to speak, in my life, good or bad. And how I handled a lot of things, I would say, were poorly. So to specifically answer your question, um, I uh, I didn't sever communications from the family, but it was just such a low priority. I for years. Uh, I then evolved into, I hadn't seen any of my family for, it'd go three, four, five years. Um, I never, ever had a single um, civilian friend left. Um, I was, just became so, so focused um, once I passed selection. Um, when I remember when I was in the, when the infantry, I did several years in the infantry. When I was in the infantry, I, I was still fairly connected, both with some school friends and others. But once I joined special forces, um, Honestly, and that and that's why it stirs me a little bit because I, I you know, basically severed every other person in my life. Um, I, I just had no time, uh, no care, no want, no worry. That they, they just were not a component of my thought. Um, I applied every single drop I had um, to that. So that that answers your question. It probably doesn't answer the the ladies. Uh, question um i think the best thing to do uh, what i would certainly recommend is to maintain that contact i think any natural good parent uh worries and i don't think i handled or afforded that worry enough empathy um yeah it's always like i'll be right i mean i would deploy and not even call them beforehand um or I remember what happened the first couple of times. And because also sometimes the deployments are secretive and it depends where you're going and what you're doing. You know, you can't ring people up. You know, you sit on your phone and ring five people that night and people know you're going somewhere and it just puts you in a predicament and, I, and you learn this. So I learned um, that sometimes it was easier, sadly, just not to call. Um, and then you might be somewhere for a month or two and you ring up and they go, well, I haven't heard from you. Like, yeah, I'm overseas. And like, where are you? And like, I'm just away when you're coming home i don't know um and then and then they just get into that get into that vibe of conversation but i think the point i'm making is then that to me is unhealthy because every question they ask you're sort of cutting them off so then they stop asking and now i sort of say that out loud when i look back retrospectively that's kind of what happened because then i felt I, um, you know, I got a little bit disgruntled because people weren't calling me and I'm like, does, does no one like care what I'm doing out here in the world? You know? So I can remember now having those thoughts, but it was me who, you know, I created that scenario by, you know, not keeping in touch with people and, you know, not offering the little bits of information that I could. So then next minute people don't bother calling you. You know what I mean? It's, 
and then and then you're like, well, why don't you walk out? And they're like, well, we called you ten times, you don't answer, or you're always away, or and you start these things happen, and then rather than uh, you know putting things in place to fix and manage those relationships, like I said, I kind of just shrug my shoulders on that. You know, I've, I've got this war over here going on, um, and yeah, it probably made things worse, or not probably it did. H, there are a couple questions following up from this that are, I think, really interesting to dig into. As you talk about like disconnecting from people, have you turned that around now? Now that you've been out and had time, like, are you better at connecting with others, or is it still a challenge for you? Uh, in short, no, I'm definitely better. Um, I now almost laugh and realize how bad I was. Um, so as I say, when I'm, you know, talking either casually or coaching or mentoring, you know, guys who are in the unit now are going to join, like you get in a vortex and that's what I'm saying when they're like, no, nah, nah, I'm good. I'm like, you don't know where you are right now. Trust me. A lot. I literally lost me for, you know, like decades. Um, so what I've done now is I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm just more proactive in, you know, uh, ensuring that I'm communicating something is in like, oh, I haven't called them for a week. Um, with my uh, persona and personality, you know, I, I deliberately have to try and soften it a bit if it's someone, and I know you didn't ask that, but it's relevant in my communication with when you're talking to someone now because, you know, people would literally just be, you know, scared or intimidated. And I, you know, yes, are there times where I've deliberately intimidated people? Bloody oath. And there's times where you need to to achieve your objective uh, whether it's a meeting, you know, in Australia with some uh, important senior sirs that you're trying to, um, you know, get something to go over the line or whether you're sitting down having chai uh, tea in the middle of Afghanistan or whether you're, um, you know, smoking a pipe in Iraq, there's times you need to put across a, a certain persona. And, in, you know, as you would be aware, we get trained in that. So, you know, I needed to learn how to soften that. And the last point that I'll say, which I, I still find you know, um, not amu you know, amusing, I guess, is um, our management of our personal information, which ties into that communication. So um, in, in Australia, and I know it's the same with the tier one units and some other um, identities in the US, in Australia, we have what's a, a, called a gazetted protected identity status. So it's a, it's a, it's a status um, which is formal. Um, and that means, you know, if you're in a normal unit and you're trying to find my information, you can't. Um, means that I only have to give X amount of information to people. You know, if I'm in court, I'll be referred to as Mr. W, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, and, and that is exactly for the reasons, as the title says, it's to protect our identity, it's to protect our families. So when, you know, you have to go somewhere and fill out a form or give information on something, and they're like, can I give you a name, please? And they'll be like, you know, you give a false name, depending on what it's for, if you can get away with a false name or... But then even now, like uh, I just as I was just saying to you, I, I picked up a new um, Australian cattle dog um, last night. So I go to the um, pet food joint, which I didn't, uh, I had never previously had an account with. But I was like, oh, I'll get an account now because you know you get discounts and you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they asked me all my details, and I was kind of like, well, just all you need is this and this. And he's like, yeah, I'm just trying to fill a form out here, mate. So you're still in this state of, you know, like hesitant to just and, – and when also when people are being just friendly, like they're – you know, they'll pass you or they know you and they'll ask you a simple question like, hey, mate, like, oh, I mate, mean, mate, I've seen you around here. What's your name? And I'll be like, what do you want to know my name? You know, so you have this natural defensive uh, answer – as opposed to, you know, and then, and you still do this sometimes now, it's so ingrained in you that, you know, like, why are you interested in me? And I used to be, I can remember when I was getting sort of really, really spun up after a few trips and the, and the rest period uh, in between was tighter and you weren't coming back here resting anyway, you were doing a hundred other things or counterterrorism operations or whatever. And I can remember stages for years when I'd be sitting somewhere and if, and if you side glanced at me, I would stand up, walk over to you and say, what are you looking at me for? Like I was that uh, hyper, like, I was, you know, I was sitting in the bell tower that, you know, or I would leave, you know, I'm like, hey, so, you know, if I was with, um, you know, wife or a girlfriend, you know, I'd be like, hey, guys, looking at us, you need to go. And they're like, I think they're just looking around the room like, no, nah, let's get out of here. Like get the bill and move. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's uh, obviously a bit to it all there, but you get the point. Got it. I, I'm going to ask one more question um, here on the – 
from this mom's perspective, like if, if they have, if somebody's listening and they have a son who's in a, a situation like that, who's not communicating, but they know they're in one of these tier one units, what would you say to them? Like, h- how would you view that? Are they dialed in probably like they're, how would you see it? Yeah, I would, I would, that's to me, is probably really easy to answer Ryan is I, I would keep communicating to them. Um, you know, because th- this is where the issue occurs. So if your mindset is pure and sincere, then you've got to, you've got to, um, you've got to assume theirs is, but it's in a different place. So, you know, to me, you just, you know, e- even as a tier one seasoned operator, you just can't fill that full spectrum, emotional intelligence spectrum. So I think what we do is we need to start cut or what naturally happens is we like cut chunks out of it. And what I mean by that is, you know, you can't, you can't go and do what we do any other given night or day or for months or weeks on an end. And then, you know, be just, you know, get, then get on the phone and say, Hey mom, you know, I've been going well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, and then the more you do that, the more, um, you know, the, the, the more experiences, you know, that you're holding and obviously those experiences subsequently change you. So all I would say simply is, um, always keep communicating and just show them that you're thinking of them and show them that you love them still, uh, and that you care about them and that you look forward because, if he's not communicating, he or she is not communicating back, you know, there could be a myriad of reasons why, but for you to stop that communication going forward, even though it's not coming back, then that's going to be, I think 90% of the time read incorrectly. And to me, it's, I'll use another analogy or an example. It's the same, you know, those friends you invite over for a barbecue and you invite them over to your place two or three times and they're bloody good friends of yours and you put a spread on for them. And then you realize, you're like, why haven't they ever invited us to ours? And, you know, I developed this theory with a few friends and, and, and you know, with, again, with certain partners, they're like, well, you know what? I'm not inviting them over here anymore. And I'm like, you know what? This is the way the whole world works. If you now cease to do that, that ceases to happen. So you either just go shrug your shoulders and keep inviting them over for a barbecue and enjoying their company and having a good time because they're friends of yours. And don't read too much into the other aspect of it because there could be so many reasons why. Um, or, or some people literally just don't, they just don't even think about it. So to me, you know, the single piece, biggest piece of advice, you know, I give a lot of people is, is communication. You know, half the wars in this world would not have been fought <laughs> if some people just spoke. Um, you know, half the relationships um, that separate or get themselves in a problem wouldn't if they just spoke. Um, people, when they get themselves into financial problems, if they went and saw the banker. People who are in an unhealthy uh, professional environment in their in their workspace, you know, because the first question I ask them, you know, have you spoken to your boss? Have you spoken to your manager? Have you told them this? Have you? And they're like, no. I'm like, why not? You know, so, um, you know, I, I really belt on a lot about, just communicate. And whenever I'm running anything, you know, with some of the consulting and other work I've done, you know, the first thing when I bring the team in is I'm like, okay, I like flat comms. Don't over communicate to me. And I don't need, you know, little eyes and dots and please and thank yous written on everything. You know, if it's short and sharp, it won't offend me, but keep it flat as in, you know, so that everybody knows what's happening. If, if you just CC'd or BCC'd or it's a group text or whatever, I don't need to read it all. But I've got the information. And I find, you know, by sort of putting it out like that up front, first and foremost, um, you know, the, the um, you know, cohesiveness and effectiveness of the team and, you know, whatever it is you're trying to achieve um, you know, is always on the front foot because every other environment I've been in when they don't do that or people are funny about who talks to who, you know, the first thing that happens is like, you know, something will occur and be like, well, I didn't know that. Or when was I going to get told? You know, and you'll, you'll hear and you'd be remember Ryan comments like this and you're kind of like. We'll move on from the therapy session here. I just really want to, I thought it was a great question that came in from a mother just genuinely concerned about how other people do this. And we'll, we will dig in here. Yeah. 
So let's um, let's talk about what it's like being 17 and going off um, into this life. Um, I've interviewed Mark Wales. I've interviewed Dan Pronk. We've talked the SAS kind of pipeline. I know nothing about the commando pipeline. So it sounds like there's some infantry time beforehand. Could you just talk to us? What was it like for you? And am I correct? Is this early 90s, H, that we're talking? Yes. Yeah, so the timeline was I joined in 1990. Uh, and then I did selection in 98. So in regards to those pipelines, there's a couple of different ways you can go, um, and which I, which I think is still similar to SSR because they, they have changed and um, done a lot of development in the last few years. Um, but the short of it, what I did is it is uh, certainly preferred and recommended, and in the earlier days it was essential, that you need to come from what's called an arms background. So an arms background um, in uh, in US terms would be not that dissimilar. So it's you know infantry, uh, engineers, you know artillery, um, you know basically fighting elements um, of whichever service. But in uh, in Australia, you could only join from the army. Um, that's now changed. But when I joined, it was only army personnel. And then you would have to transfer to the infantry. Um, so we have a, um, like most units, a selection process. Um, and that's varied over the years from, you know, two weeks to three weeks to a month. Um, I think at the moment sitting at somewhere about 21, 28 days. Um, and that component is purely selection. Um, so prior to that, Sorry to take, go back one step. So prior to that, you would, um, you know, step one in Australia is you'd put your paperwork in, um, and that needs to go through some internal um, checks in the unit. Um, so the unit that you're currently residing and posted to, um, and it needs your commander's endorsement um, that he's saying, you know, that you're approved to go and do this. Um, then the next thing you know would be um, at the special forces training center where who who um, steers the selection process. You know they would receive this paperwork and and then they do their checks and balances. Then you would go through to having uh, an interview um, and doing some um, further testing, physical and psychological uh, and aptitude testing, and then um, all those what we call candidates are you know put on a, um, you know, a spreadsheet and with scores and remarks, et cetera. Uh, and we, so the human factor would sit down um, and I actually did a, um, a year at the Special Forces Training Centre as the Wing Sergeant Major who, who steers this uh, process. And we would um, sit there and basically go through every single person, name by name, line by line. Um, and to a lesser degree, because we didn't like personalities to be involved, but if someone knew them or, or, or had some sort of regard, you know, they, they're free to comment about them. Um, but primarily at this stage in the game, it is about how they appear on paper. So, you know, if, if you don't have any disciplinary action, you know, if you've got a couple of years under your belt, maybe they're a lance corporal or a corporal, um, done a specialist course or an operation, so we're just like, you know, and, and all the other scoring is looking right because, remember, you might have uh, five, 600 of these applicants come through. So we want to cut that down to about 100, 120 to get off a bus or buses. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty rough hack screening process. So there needs to be something that jumps out for us to drop you. Um, and, you know, that may be he's 18 and we've got, you know, over here 100 people that are 26, 27, 28. That doesn't mean that 18-year-old couldn't make it, um, but you know, because there's uh, immature 18-year-olds and there's mature 18-year-olds just like there's immature 13-year-olds and there's mature 30-year-olds. You get the point. Um, but when you're just looking at someone on paper, uh, you know what I mean, and you've got to get through this. Um, so then it progresses to those persons being told um, that they'll, uh, will now they've been accepted for the next selection course and generally you know i think that gives them about a you know six to 12 month run out depending on different cycles and seasons and whatnot um and then day uh one or day zero as i call it uh is when they arrive and um get off the bus um and and that is um uh, you know a similar scene or scenario um that i'm sure some of the listeners have you know seen or heard of 
um, where we deliberately um, create a, a very uh, hostile, imposing, intimidating type of um, environment. Um, and, and everything is, you know, to the letter of the T and, you know, we've got a plan on how, you know, we just, we just want to, you know, rock them a little bit at the start and sort of see who's who. Um, and then, um, and we change this ever so slightly all the time and, and the sequencing obviously to keep people on their toes because people talk to each other and that's fine. Um, but I find that has little effect because once you're there, they still don't know what's going to happen. So then, you know, what we would do next, um, you know, once we get them out, you know, go through the roll call type scenario and then straight away they know um, because immediately, you know, they are um, disciplined for, you know, if anyone lags in replying for their name, if anyone's wearing the wrong thing, you know, then we do a chit, kit check. And, um, you know, the kit check was all, always one of my favourite. I would run that. So it's one of the first sort of main group activities I would do um, why, why is that H? Why is that? What are your favorites? Well, to, to, to check off the items. So they're given a list and on the list, you can imagine how specific it is and you know where this is going. It's like you'd have two white t-shirts of this brand and you know, your name is to be written in this many millimeters across the chest, dead central. You know, you'd have these two water bottles that are to be clean and rah, rah. So we would just call out an item and they hold it up. And there's instructors everywhere through the ranks. And every single time we find one misdemeanor, and my command might be as simple as this, uh, pull out your one of your water bottles and raise it with a straight arm with your left arm. Well, someone's arm's going to have a kink in it. Someone's going to put it in their other arm. So every single one of those occurrences, you've got 120 people there, is a punishment. Um so I think I held the record for the longest kit check. I think it finished in about eight and a half hours, and they were they were done. <laughs> they were they were literally absolutely spent. It was forty odd degrees heat, um, and I remember talking to the guys afterwards. They're still like that kit check, man. I was like, so they haven't even started selection yet, and and we had guys withdraw, as in we had we had guys put their hand up, going, I'm, I'm done. I, I just want to get back on that bus, man. I, I'm not doing this kit check anymore. Um, yeah, you talk about like thousands of push-ups, thousands of burpees, thousands, just anything. Um, but again, you know, all jokes aside, and it's kind of funny now. Um, but you know, every single person there who did what was on the instruction list, and they did what they were asked to do at that time, you know, they were only part of a group punishment. But you know, there's no punishments given for any of that. And straight away, it's just teaching them that, like, do as it says, do exactly as it says. And, you know, the attention to detail and the discipline and the listening to what's being told, you're going to be told once it's precise. We know what we said, just do that. And, you know, it's, it really sets the scene and, and that's, you know, why we do it because it sets the scene. And if you haven't picked it up and if on day two and three, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to tell you something twice or remind you of what was written somewhere or the instruction you were given the night before, you know, how are you going to carry out complex missions? So th there is a purpose to it all, but it's quite funny now looking back at it. That's great. H having run that school, H, what, um, what do you, are you able to tell just having run that and been through it yourself? When these guys come off the bus, are you able to say, this guy's not going to make it, this guy does? Or, or is it just, you just really don't know until they're put into a stressful situation? There, there is, um, yeah, I love that question. There, I'll be, there, there are people that I have within five minutes made a comment to a DS very discreetly made a comment to a DS gone. That guy's gone today and they'll be gone today. And we, we're not deliberately trying to make him go today, but it's just that there is a, there is at times definitely a vibe that you just pick up. Um, and you need to be quite experienced uh, with that. Like some guys be like, no way, like the guy looks solid. I was like, nah, something about it. And there will be something about him. Um, then you always get, you know, what we call in Australia, you know, the, the grey horse. Um, that you know is that guy who might not. I mean, let's be real. That there, there, you know, there is a bit of a stereotype about you know what a special ops guy sort of looks like in his shape and his mannerisms and. Yeah, he looks. He looks like you, H. <laughs> That's the stereotype, man. But uh, these, all these tattoos are fake. I just did them quickly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so you, you would, um, 
you'd get that guy um, who, you know, might be a lot smaller in frame. Uh, he just has a, a different, softer personality. Um, and, you know, I learned fast, um, you know, that these guys, are, you know, you need those guys. And they, you know, that we don't all need to be like this. Um, we need to have our characteristics and our attributes and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to pass all those skills, which those guys do. But it's, I guess it wasn't until later and with some other, um, you know, quite, you know, unique and um, some of the compartmentalized um, job role functions and specific stuff um, that, you know, there's those guys that they really blossom in that world um, and in those roles because, you know, maybe, you know, we want someone who is a lot more, um, you know, un, unassuming, um, you know, some of the, and then, you know, you've got other people that, you know, may not be as physically, um, you know, robust um, as, you know, some of the other guys, um, but intellectually, you know, they can run absolute rings around them. You know, that's where you get these, you know, I call them these, excuse me, I call them these X factors where you get these guys on selection and, you know, you would have skim red all over the files, but then when you're actually talking to them and some longer walks, you know, we'll deliberately chat with them. And um, be like, you know, what, what's your story again, mate? What'd you do? Oh, you know, I've got my own optometrist business and I, I'm like, <laughs> just like, and you're like, like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, um, and, you know, they, 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 there's no bias towards those guys, but, you know, there are people that come through and, you know, I'm more than comfortable and happy to say this, that I would go into bat quite hard for because, you know, as a special operations community, and when you look at the full spectrum of things that you you know in your task spectrum and task suite, you know it might be really fucking handy to have you know someone who's a, you know a qualified pilot, or um, you know could um, you know act as a optometrist or could do this or could or not act as they are, you know. So um, like I said, there's no bias towards those people, but you know if if uh, persons uh, with um, that have got, you know, some other distinct professional attributes um, that would be a big asset to the unit and the organisation and maybe they're on that, they're still in, inside, you know, the spectrum, but maybe they're on the fringe of, you know, where you might cut someone else, then, you know, I've, I've argued black and blue to get those people over the line and have uh, and don't regret it and you later on other people haven't either, you know, they're like, that was a good call. Um, so I guess that's another component that you just get a feel you know, for different people and different things, you know, how are they going to fit in the organization? And, you know, because not every, well, everyone needs to be an operator first and foremost, and very much so. But, you know, you could have a guy go, you know what, you know, two to three years, um, you know, and with a couple of tools on his belt, you know, this, this guy's, you know, going to be able to start this whole capability that we've been talking about that they don't even know about that yet. And that's quite close hold or whatever. You know, um, so yeah, there, there's there's a lot to it, and I really, really, really enjoy, you know, the human factor. Like that is my juice. Like I, I love the psychology and, and the interaction and the you know intimacy and detail of those interactions and our discussions about people. You know, when we're sitting around doing what's called the board of studies, so you'd sit around every few days, or there'd be special ones for certain occasions or people and it's that it's a study on that person and every single thing is written down jotted down in DS's book and we have all this information and we sit there and while they're you know we'll push one or two guys out there get them them to go do another activity and we're sitting there reviewing and talking about everything every every speck of detail the color of his socks the size of his feet you know like you name it um there's a there's a lot lot goes into behind the scenes um, to get that best product um, over the line. And then for us, just quickly, you know, that's just the selection component. You've got another year worth of courses and training. So once you're selected, they don't get their beret anymore. We used to go like that. You you get beret, which means you're fully qualified and you're in the unit and you can could deploy them the next day after you've finished everything. You know, so... Um, you know that there's there's a different style of pressure put upon them after that period of time. Um, you know when they're doing other skills, advanced and specialist courses, and um, but certainly like I can remember from this, like you know, 
you're very elated when you pass selection and then you kind of wake up the next day and you're just like, you're not here again, but it's like, you, you now you've got this. So you have this like selection part here like this, but now I've got like this. And it's not so when you get to the end of that and then you get to the end of that and then you get put in a team and then it's going to be deploying somewhere. You know, and it just, it just keeps going. Like there's, you know, I, I used to say, you know, the easiest part of being in special operations is doing selection. So the hardest part that people think that it is, I'm like, man, that's the easiest thing you're ever going to do. The easiest thing you'll ever do is that course because the next 5, 10, 15 years, man, we're not writing the script for that and it's not controlled. Um, so, yeah. Every tier one guy I've interviewed has said selection never ends. It's like every day is selection, basically. So, so look. Yeah, we used to have a saying, which is, sorry to interrupt you, on the spot on that. And that no, go ahead. Actual saying that we use um, is you're on a daily renewable contract. So even though you've got your beret, you're assigned in the unit, that contract that you have with us, with the man to your left and with the man to your right, the guys who have got your back and the support staff, everybody is renewable daily. You can't have an off day. So you're at optimal performance every single day you are judging, you're judging yourself, you, you're on the constant pursuit of excellence, et cetera, et cetera. And the day that you're not in the mindset and you, when I became you know, uh, quite senior and was you know, sitting on this side of the desk interviewing guys and micromanaging guys because that's what it was then because you know, we had a lot of fatigue, um, you know, I would try and spell guys because if you're not, you know, if I notice cracks appearing, I'm like, mate, you, it's just not a place where you can where you can have them. It's going to affect the mission, right? So it was like, you know, let's 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 get you some sort of rest, which is another thing quite hard to, um, you know, to orchestrate. But anyway, so I know everybody listening is going to be like, get to some action. But I I want to ask, I want to ask something else though, and I think you kind of alluded to it. If you're running the selection course, you, you're the effectively responsible for who comes out of that pipeline what was the weight like for you like the the mental emotional weight of making sure like you're producing the best people coming out the back end of this yeah again that's a really good question right one i haven't had um with it with the risk of sounding a little bit egotistical um i i was a very very hard like even in that environment so you know, compared to others, I was extremely um, hard, is how, how you'd put it, in regards to my standards. So my standards were, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, immeasurable. Um, so, you know, if, if, the, if the unit bar was here and then the normal bar was here, you know, I would create another bar. <laughs> um, now, with selection, you know, I can't do that so much, but I certainly, um, you know, that the, People will say, you know, that, that that selection course is the hardest selection course, and all those sort of things. And they're kind of, they're not, they're not. It's not so much that they're good to hear or whatever. But back to your question, you know, there there is. Uh, I took that responsibility beyond seriously. Um, you know, to me, and you know, after you have that experience in a unit, you you really know and realize, you know, some of the circumstances or predicaments that these guys could get into. Um, and as you'll hear me say, and as I've said, it, it's so much about the man to your left and right as well. So, you know, it's not just who I'm putting in there. He may, he, he could, if he's, you know, if we make a mistake, so to speak, jeopardize someone else's, you know, life or future or, or limb uh, or whatever it may be. So, you know, I took it very, very seriously. Um, but also, you know, because I mentioned, you know, how hard I was, but also, you know, in a, you, know, you need to nurture components of it. You know, you, you're fostering a, you know, culture and an ethos and, you, you know, and that's what I love about it. You know, through a year, like what you can do to an individual is, is you know, with the, any, with the whole resources in the world, basically, and, and a budget at your feet, um, you know, you, you can create something uh, quite special. And I, I took that. Um, you know, very, very, um, very personally, and, and you're right, yes, you know, there's a lot of weight to it. Um, but if I was to summarize it in any way, I found it like immensely enjoyable, and I grew a lot myself, like, I learned a lot 
about people. You know, I had a good relationship with the psychologists in the unit anyway, but, you know, I was working, you know, you're basically in almost daily contact with a psychologist and because I dig that shit, um, you know, I just really love, you know, yeah, just, I just learnt like a lot, um, you know, and it might have been, you know, confirming or reiterating something I thought I knew, but I, I just, if I could do anything again, you know, like going overseas and, you know, getting in shit fights is, you know, fantastic. But where my headspace is at, right, and I'll do that again tomorrow, but where my headspace is at right now, I, I would love to consult to a selection process. Like that, to me, I get, yeah, I get so much enjoyment out of that and and, and, and so much satisfaction because, like I said, you're helping and shaping and you're passing on, you know, something and changing someone's life, literally. Awesome. I do remember when we were going through, like even when we got through our first units in, in an aviation um, regiment, like you'd go through check rides with different instructors and nobody wanted the hard ass, like with the high standards, but every, everyone knew that the guys who passed through that person's gate, you know, like if you made it through that process and, and that guy blessed you off, you were good to go. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about there. That's great. Um, okay. So we're talking early nineties. You're in, you're in the infantry. You don't go to selection until 98, but I do believe you find yourself in Somalia around the same time as, as what we know as Black Hawk down. What were you doing there? What, what was happening? Yeah. So uh, Somalia was uh, quite unique, uh, in the fact that, you know, I don't think we had any national invested interests there. Um, and, you know, there certainly wasn't, you know, the, the piracy which developed or the terrorism, uh, elements that have you know morphed there now, um, so I think it was more um, p- quite quite possibly you know specifically at the request uh, of the US who who were there uh, and some other coalition partners, um, and, and I'm sure there was a bit more all to it, but I was far too young to to really uh, understand the why. But it was also very unique for Australia because um, unlike the US, you know Australia just you know wasn't um, you know, we hadn't had that many conflicts. And to put that into perspective, um, when we deployed, which was not the start of 1993, the um, our last largest uh, deployment of like an infantry battalion somewhere on the other side of the world was Vietnam. So the Australian Army uh, and the Australian Defence Force, that matter, had gone through a, a very uh, protracted period of time of peace. Um, and, and, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, for, for people who went through that period, you know, they, they all had become you know, a little bit bitter and twisted. So when this deployment came up and the fact that I'd only been in the army a couple of years, you know, the timing of it, you know, with my development and training, and everything was just, you know, when I look back at it, it was, you know, literally perfect. Um, and I found it a really, really enjoyable deployment, you know, from a first deployment, uh, it wasn't, you know, extremely combat intense in regards to their specific firefights. But, you know, we were out patrolling intensely every other day in both vehicle mounted patrols, foot patrols. Um, I was a forward scout. Um, the, um, you know, the enemy or the militia, as they referred to at the time, uh, there were, were also extremely, um, you know, random. Um, and when I look back, you know, they're probably more insurgent-like um, than anything else. As in, you know, they would commandeer vehicles, make um, makeshift machine gun mounts, technicals, as they were called, uh, upon them, um, and and uh, from a intelligence gathering perspective, now knowing all what I know, um, we were certainly not equipped, um, you know, for a um, you know for an enemy figure like that. Um, and now you know, learnt and you know when you referred to Black Hawk down, you know, uh, unfortunately, in respect to all those men who lost their lives, but you know, there's some hard special ops and other lessons learnt about operating in these environments where, you know, we can put these task forces forward where you don't realise how remote they are until something goes down like that because you think they're operating this environment where you've only got these couple of sort of thugs. But the situation there, you know, we found um, and and certainly, um, sadly, the Americans found, you know, could boil over and become something so much larger so quick and that you'd have no read on. As in, you know, we would not have 
this uh, you know intelligence picture or any tip offs or you know anything about um, so but I found you know the operating environment when I look back at it I, I would love to have gone back to Africa and special ops like that was that was one thing you know towards the latter part of my career I just I don't, it's really hard to define right I I just you know you you've got enough uh, cover but you haven't got the mountains you've got the heat um, you know where now I know where they'd be residing you know in these outlining villages or in these built up areas there's sort of no in between so you need to be doing rage and strikes you know where you'd be coming in on those you know a couple of kilometer offset infills um, you know getting right in on the doorsteps or you know you'd be coming in hot on rooftops and I don't think there'd be much in between um, and I, I just think you know that um, frankly um, parts of the Horn of Africa need you know a, a good special operations task force in there for a year or so to, to clean it out for one of a better term that's just being honest and it's just a thing you know like because because I've been there you know as this young infantry soldier and then you know seeing things develop there over the years and and knowing uh, some of my US friends that uh, did operations uh, both in Smarter and other components of Africa. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I just really, it's probably one of the only places I really ever wanted to go back to or that I hadn't gone to. Um, just, I guess, you know, just that first place. But to go back there now with all those other skills and experiences, you know, I'll be, I'll be just like, you know, like, yes, like, you know, that's probably more so. So, I, I know you've done probably thousands of raids. It, I don't know if you can recall the first time you went outside the wire in Somalia. Like if you can even bring it up, even if it was just a your first patrol, if it was quiet, what was it like for you since from the moment you can remember you wanted to be in the military and now you're finally like in combat effectively? Yeah, it was funny. I can remember it was the first night we drove out um, to do a handover takeover with some U.S. Marines. So we were in um, the armoured personnel carrier, being the M113, um, so Vietnam era, quite old, and they were ours, and so they were attached to us. And the Marines, I believe, were in that Amtrak, um, would have been the first gen, you know, when you look at what time it was. Because um, one of the things to to control areas is we'd put, um, you know, V... We would put VCP. Did you hear all that? Barely. You're good. Promise, promise. We'd put, I'm supposed to, we'd put um, VCPs in, um, as in vehicle checkpoints in areas, um, you know, because obviously, you know, they were trying to use these highways or conduct this or conduct that. So, you know, just like you use them anywhere else, you know, they're a control point. Um, so they had, um, you know, quite a significant one established, you know, and I can't remember exactly what area it was. In, oh, it would have been near Baydoa, um, but specifically I can't remember um, because we, um, the, so the Australian task force that was there, um, our base was at the Baydoa airfield um, as opposed to Mogadishu or anywhere else. And we also set up a sub base at a little place called Barakaba, which I think is about, like, about an hour and a half away. Anyway, um, so, yeah, we went out and I can remember it distinctly, you know, those first experiences of, you know, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of surreal, you know, when your whole life you've wanted and, you know, aspired this thing and now here I am of all places in the world in Somalia, you know, with a loaded rifle in my hand, you know, green and keen still, you know, I've only been in a couple of years, I've done a recon course, I've done a tracking course, you know, I think I'm a pretty sort of special, pretty shit hot little soldier. I'm the forward scout. You know, I loved all my, you know, attention to detail and all my gear. You know, I was that, I was that guy. I, like, I was as green as green. And when I look at other guys, and again, I'm not saying it's about me, but when I look at other guys in the section, you know, I'd look at them, some of them are disgusted. You know, I'm like, fuck, he's a little bit overweight or clearly he didn't clean his weapon this morning. You know, I, was, I, was, I was that soldier. I was that, I was just, I can't describe him more. I was just green as green. And so when I remember getting out, and um, you know we're trailing out, and as far as I'm concerned, you know I was I was prepared for anything. I was like, you know, no matter what happens tonight, like you know, I was just I was excited. I wasn't nervous, wasn't anxious. I was just I was excited. I'm like, this is what I've trained for, I'm, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm you know, I'm destined to get in, you know, some big stash, and something's going to happen. And 
and you know nothing happened that night um or nothing you know worthy of mention but it, it was just funny and then i remember and um you know no offense to all the highly professional excellent marines i've worked with but i remember getting to where the uh the where we had to do the handover with the marines and you know the way that they were sitting around on top of the vehicle and stuff and i'm like you know i'm here like this you know all excited like you know patrolling around and i'm like and these guys are like man just i can chill out bro there ain't nothing around here and i'm like you know like I, i'm like that's not the mindset to have <laughs> you know i was like you know and i remember you know a couple of weeks later i was probably like leaning against the vehicle myself but you know, that night i'm like literally patrolling around you know my rifle up you know just from like point a to point b people like just relaxed dude. i'm like i'm relaxed but i'm ready love it but, um, it was, it was it was a really good experience, and it was it was really, you know, I, I went over there. When I look back, you know, I, I was I was pretty mature for my age, but I certainly, you know, and I've said before on other podcasts and interviews and stuff, you know, I went over there, boy, I certainly came back a man. Like I was, you know, definitely changed uh, and for the better. You know, I wasn't I wasn't too sort of scarred or tarnished by it all. Um, one thing, you know, I will say uh, about Somalia and with some friends who went on another deployment shortly after to Rwanda. Um, you know, the human factor there, um, you know, can certainly take a notch out of you. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, the, the uh, massive amounts of, um, you know, um, casualties and deaths, um, and how that they occur, you know, with, um, uh, large knife type injuries as in machetes and blades and stuff like that, you know, they would, they would massacre, um, volumes of people in these methods um and other uh, atrocities uh, now i know them as and um you know as a young fellow the first time you see that stuff you know you it kind of shakes you up a little bit but it also you know when i look back when i was younger and at all the things you know, i wanted and you see in these movies you know you know hollywood bullshit essentially of you know some single special ops guy standing at the foot of something going you know i'll oh, get rid of all these people and when you're standing there you know obviously the feelings you know completely different um to what may be portrayed and um you know they're little things that just start to as i know now when i look back uh, you know i guess that was the start of you know the toll being taken um but, you know, I certainly got more good experiences out of Smarter than I did bad. But, you know, I just make that note that there, there were uh, things um, in those particular conflicts um, that are just different. You know, like you see some horrible things in Iraq, you see some horrible things in Afghanistan. But, you know, Africans, quite frankly, are just renowned to be ruthlessly horrible um, when it comes to getting rid of large amounts of people. And we still see it. You know, every few years, uh, massacres and atrocities there um, committed by their own people, which is another thing. You know, it's not it's not some other foreign element coming in. Um, it's quite often more than not their own people, um, and it's just it's unexplainable. It's it's staggering, and it often gets missed by large scale media. It's only those you know secondary tertiary media branches that report on it. No one's interested in it. You know, and I don't say that like you know I sit here and lose sleep over components of Africa, but when you think about it, everything else that we focus on in this world, it it's, uh, can be a little bit sad what happens over there. If you just looked at the numbers, I mean, it's significant. Um, you, you mentioned something I just don't want to lose. You said you went over there, a kid, you came back a man. Was it in a single event or was it a buildup during that deployment? Like what what was it that made you feel like you had that flip? I, th I think it was a, it was a buildup. Um, yeah, you know, I don't think it was any one single thing. It was certainly a, a cumulative um stack of events um and just time ryan you know um in the in 1992 93 um you know australia had no um you know what would you call it no no we had no welfare component to missions or deployments we hadn't been there long enough like you know even by the back of vietnam you know, you could go, or not by the back, by the mid tours or whatever it was. You know, you could go and have R and R. You have beers. You know, you can call home or write home or whatever it may be. Um, we were there. Like I don't know. It, it'd be months before we got a phone call back home. Um, and those phones were U.S. phones. So you know, some drug deal was done. You know, as often it is um, to share that. Um, and when I say drug deal, I mean that in a colloquial sense. Yeah, we, we got you. Be, be, be careful now, 
That's right. No, all good. <laughs> that, um, you know, to share um, that asset. And I can remember you'd stand there in that. So there was this little green box that had a phone. I can't, it wasn't a sat phone. I don't know what it was, or maybe it was. Anyway, it was out in the sun, you know, this bit of flapping shade cloth. And there'd be literally a line of like 200 guys standing there. And there's a, a guy there with a, you know, some NCO, some Marine, poor Marine, you know, be like, 10 minutes is up, you know, and you have like 30 seconds to hang out and the next guy steps in. Um, so, you know, it, one, you know, it was a process to go through. It didn't happen for a long time. And then when you got there to go about doing it, it wasn't really pleasant. And then everyone's like standing there listening to your phone call and you're in fucking 400 degrees heat. It's like, yeah, how's things going? You know, I can't say this and I can't say that and I can't say anything else and I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so a lot of people just stopped using the phone. You know, it was more, it was more detrimental. But I guess back to your question, you know, it was, it was things like that you know, it all just accumulated. So, you know, you were cut off from correspondence, um, you know, letters. And when I look back, this is, you know, I'm not bragging about this. This is actually horrible when I look back at it. But the way our company worked, my platoon is when letter day come, they'd stand us all there. And if you got a letter, you go over there and you read your letter. If you didn't get a letter, you go and go sit over on this hill. <laughs> like as in, they're, they're all the guys that didn't get a letter. Like no one cares about you. You go sit on the hill over there alone. And like, I know how horrible that sounds to listeners. It was done, and that's why I said it is horrible, but like it started off as a joke. But when I look back at it now, I'm like, like how? imagine if a guy, I don't, and I can't even remember, like if a guy sat on that hill every letter day. I'm sure there was someone. I'm sure. It's just, it was just devastating. But um, yeah, look, it, it, it just, it, it changed me. You know, I, think, I think mostly you know, for the good. Um, you know, I can remember coming home vividly and uh, i was picked up by my partner at that time and um i only told her what like one thing i said you know i want you to pick me up i want you to pick me up in my toyota i bought a toyota new toyota full drive just before i left and i said i want you to have a bottle i can't remember i think it was johnny walker which i don't even drink so i don't know where they'll come from and um by the time we got home half that bottle of johnny walker was gone she reminds me of this because i don't remember um and yeah, I, I, you know, and again, uh, I'm not proud of that, but I, you know, drunk pretty hard for a few days, um, and had those similar coming home experiences, which obviously intensified in my later career, where, you know, um, you know, you're with your partner and you're in this beautiful, and we went straight in this beautiful, nice little place you'd set up whilst I was away, so you know, nothing could be more perfect for me in regards to that aspect, and. Um, you know, I'd be drinking and uh, just all I want to do is go out to the bar where I know the boys are going to be. And, you know, they, you know, a lot of the partners, uh, because then that 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 era of partners had no one to lean on or, or experiences as opposed to, you know, when you've got, you know, several years of this happening in Vietnam wars or in the Vietnam war, as an example, which was our large conflict. So they didn't have anyone to like call to and how do you, what's going on with these guys? Um but, you know, we just still wanted to be together um, and drink, you know. So, which, you know, drinking a little bit with the mates can certainly be very, um, you know, not rewarding, um, can, can be, you know, very good, you know, for your, for your overall health to talk about things and, and whatnot. But, you know, excessively drinking, you know, alcohol is a depressive, so... Uh, it's not good and, and then it just causes issues on the home front and um, you know obviously you know, then all those style of things started to happen not with myself but certainly with uh, many friends well I gotta say I'm impressed with your uh, with your American accent that you've thrown out a couple times here H so uh, well done there clearly you've, you've trained you've uh, you've worked with a lot of US units and companies um, so I will give a tip of the hat to you on that <laughs> Transition out of Somalia, you mentioned you go through selection in 98, and we have 9-11, obviously, in uh, 01. When do you first find yourself in that post-9-11 fight in, I think it's Afghanistan, to kick off? And what was that like? Yeah, well, that that was really a uh, absolute baptism of fire, is how I'd explain it. So uh, what happened with me, uh, this, and I don't apologize, there's no short answer, is uh, it was quite sort of unique. I wasn't sort of, was very unique. 
So what happened was I deployed with Task Force 66, which was Australia's task force designated the Special Operations Task Group assigned to Afghanistan, which was made up of SASR and two commando. Um, and sorry, I should also mention a large element as we all always need of support assets and support persons. Um, and after only a few weeks in Tarankout, where our base was, and which was our main operating area, um, or Orange Gun was our main operating area then, or our only operating area then at the start, um, is uh, myself and the platoon commander, uh, we went out to conduct the task and uh, unfortunately got a couple of vehicles uh, in, some, in some trouble as involved. And these are the Bushmaster vehicles. And some things happened and basically it uh, blew the timeline. Um, and what also happened, which was you know, extremely embarrassing at the time, was one of the uh, soldiers um, in our teams uh, lost his night vision goggles on, on the way to our objective and only told us this um, once we're at the objective. So um, what we had to do, you know, I deemed it necessary to put that on pause and it wasn't a, you know, a super high priority task or you know, hitting this target or anything like that. It was more, you know, route denial, error denial, some reconnaissance, and you know, really just getting a feel of an area and and people within it, <clears throat> offensively. But that's what it was. So because this, um, you know, um, moved some people around, as in, you know, I, I put in a snap VCP because I knew they would have been picked up and they're going to come back along that road, or highly likely to be, and a few other things. Anyway, the short of it is, so when we got back to uh, base that night, the commander um, basically questioned um, like extremely, uh, with extreme scrutiny of everything and anything that we did and didn't believe our story. Um, and our story, you know, categorically was exactly what happened. Um, and this put, um, you know, our positions in a lot of um, duress. And then almost immediately after, unbeknown to the actual commander, um, uh, who at the time was Lieutenant Colonel uh, Mark Smithhurst, uh, who's spent um, time in uh, the US uh, Special Ops Commands on exchange and was later a commander of the unit and et cetera, et cetera. Well, sorry, at that time was, but went on further to be Deputy Commander Special Operations Command. Um, you know, he, 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 his team, um, as in that were the headquarters element of the Special Operations Task Group at the time were down in Bagram and they didn't know really what was going on until uh, next minute I um, I was discharged of my duties in Tarankow and they found it best because they said that they couldn't trust us. So that at the time was an extremely, extremely hard blow, but it's the absolute best, worst decision that ever happened in my career. So what happened now was I went down to Kandahar and I was down there. Um, I can't remember what ODA, but there's an ODA headquarters in, in Kandahar um, that, um, or sorry, a um, special forces group headquarters that looked after all the ODAs in that area and region. So I was put down there as a liaison officer. I was only down there a few days and the commander reached out to me um, having found out what happened. And he, and he just said simply, and he, we knew each other intimately because we just finished, um, we just had the uh, Commonwealth Games in Melbourne in 2006. And I was one of the lead assault commanders and planners for the counterterrorism effort. So we'd just been down in Melbourne for about two or three months because um, you do a lot of build-up training. Um, you know, you need to know everything literally off the back of your hand. Uh, we were down there fully supported by our aviation element, which we had an excellent, excellent relationship with. Uh, did a lot of, lot of um, really, really, um, you know, special flying profiles in and around the city and on targets and stuff. So um, we had a very good relationship and he sent me an email and just said, hey, H, don't worry, I know what's happened. I've got something and you'll be happy with it. Words that affect. And, you know, not a man to sort of, say a lot of words or whatever about something so I, I i i was super excited i had no idea where i was going or what i was doing but i was just now not worried about anything and, and excited and then a few days later i went down to bagram uh, and he said um we're putting you inside the task force and i'll be honest like i knew heard rumors about the task force uh and for listeners you know when you deployed forward 
and, and you know, I'm not I'm just saying this because I'm, I'm talking to a primarily American um, thing. You know, the, the task force um, being the JSOC element in either Iraq or Afghanistan or any theatre for that matter, it, it's it's just well known and it's a fact. It is it is more resourced uh, and higher upskilled um, with a, a different operating picture um, and support than any other country and any other task force and any other unions. Um, so that's just, that's, that's a fact. Um, cause a lot of people will, you know, talk about it in more of an emotional setting and, you know, those guys and but it is those guys. So I'd heard about them. I knew about them. Um, and you know, you would know very well, you know, um, what their lines of communication to and how high they, they go and what at that time their primary mission was, which was hunt Osama bin Laden. Um, and then anything after that's a bonus. Um, so when he said you're going inside the task force, I had an idea of what I was getting into. Uh, I was very excited, but I, you know what I mean? You, no, no one outside of that task force, as you know, Ryan, has any really idea of what's going inside that task force except those people in it um, and those people that it's, you know, reporting to. And it's fairly uh, compartmented um, and, you know, restricted. So um, there was a, uh, a troop, uh, the, the element at that time um, was made up. I can't remember the fixed wing uh, special operations component you might. Um, obviously, there's the 160s were there, uh, an element of dev group um, and a element of rangers um, and a heap of other government uh, organisations and identities, um, you know, all of their various task force, you know, colours that were referred to back then, the oranges, the purples, the, the greens, the blues, the browns, the reds, um, which, which I found, you know, sort of amusing, you know, this little, this little rainbow thing which was made to sort of disguise unit identities. But as you know, like all these things, it was like very soon after it was like everyone knew who they were and then obviously then you pick another name. But anyway, um, so yeah, I got put in there and I was attached um, to one of the Ranger platoons um, with uh, who turned out to be a very, very good friend of mine. Um, it was kind of my left-hand man. I sort of hung off his hip to, um, you know, become more familiar with the SOPs and stuff. Um, and there was a guy uh, I won't mention because he's still serving. Um, so there's basically two guys, and both of those guys um, went on to um, – they did selection for CAG afterwards, um, and one of them was Jared uh, Van Olst, um, who um, uh, unfortunately was uh, killed up at Mazari Sharif uh, on a CAG operation um, a few years later, which um, I won't go into. Um so, you know, I, I hung around um, VA or Jared, as he was known, um, for a couple of weeks. And then the um, dev group component was rotating. Um, and so, sorry to go back a step. So, those first few weeks were just, yeah, they were, even for me, they were a big eye opener. So, uh, and again, I'm not being uh, arrogant or egotistical. Skill for skill, I was more than happy, more than competent. Because at the time, I was, I was probably as sharp as I ever ever was. You know, because when you're on the counterterrorism role, you you are shooting and moving literally all day, every night, um, and your skills have to be, you know, the absolute premium um, because of the you know role you're doing. You're the Australian National Force of Last Resort, as it's called, and when you're called upon. Um, you know, it's a no-fail mission, as in there's, there's, there's no option. You know, your mission must succeed irrespective of what that cost may look like. So after just being on there for almost two years and being on the most significant sort of counterterrorism operation since 9-11, which was Operation Acolyte, being the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne, um, I was happy, you know, with where I was, Um as in personally, skills wise, and but you know, having the exposure to those profiles of, or the mission profiles um, that the task force um, you know does, and the, the assets that they have, to me it was you know, I'll be honest, it was, it was like being in Hollywood. Like I was, I was just so happy and just enjoying every moment of it. Like I'm like, this is what you know I wanted. You now the Australians, don't get me wrong, up at Task Force sixty six. You know, as the guys on the ground, you know, will 100% stand beside any special operations task force in the world and in some surpass them. But we'll, 
you know, we won't get into some ego match. But what we don't have and what American task forces have is those assets and how they're all linked and the true jointness. And that's, you know, what I hadn't worked in before. Um, and that's what I was, you know, because to me, you know, if, if you put a soldier out on the ground, then he should have the following assets, you know, whereas we didn't have a dedicated, you know, special operations rotor wing package. We didn't have dedicated special operations fixed wing package. You know, we didn't have dedicated ISR. We didn't have, you know, you get the picture. Um, whereas, you know, being a tier one element and obviously um, being mainly constructed, if not totally constructed from JSOC elements, then, you know, that, that was all a given, as you know, uh, all too well. Um, so, you know, rolling, you know, with these guys was just, you know, it was just amazing. You know, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. And it was a total, like, eye-opener to a level that I'd only read or heard about operating in. And then I was doing it, you know, every night we're going out, uh, either on, you know, direct actions or time-sensitive targets or, or then doing follow-on missions or whatever. And we were truly nocturnal. Um, which is another thing that the Australian Task Force had sort of practiced, but we couldn't really afford it. Uh, and when I mean afford it, we couldn't, we, we knew to operate in that thing, but we had to take assets when we could get assets. So 10th Mountain would sl might slice us off, you know, four Blackhawks, two Chinooks and two Apaches or Cobras or something. Um, and we may only have them for four hours. And that may be from 1400 to 1800 or something. <laughs> You know, so and Australians being Australians, you know, and sometimes maybe being too willing to say yes and accept risks, um, and you know, some of that we paid for dearly, but we'd be like, no worries, we'll we'll roll that dice in the middle of the day. And people are like, what? And we're like, you know, because otherwise it, the mission wouldn't get done, and that's the point I'm making. Whereas, you know, once I was attached to the task force, you, you know, if all the ducks in the line. Um, which mostly, you know, you had the assets to make them align, you know, we would go. And the target packs, like I said, you know, it's starting at Osama bin Laden, okay, we've got nothing on him tonight, you know, next associate, next associate. And you literally, I can still see it. And you would have probably seen these some in some of your experience as well, you know, to be on the board you know, with literally an X on a head you know, with a name under it. And, you know, we're just working our way down. Um, but you are always starting at the top and that's the point I'm making, whereas, probably in 66 in the early days until we certainly had, you know, our uh, intelligence fusion cells and things a lot more refined and got a lot more experience. We were probably working, you know, somewhere in the middle down or working from the down up and, oh, that might lead to a big guy um, because we just, we just didn't have the uh, assets, resources, the experience in the picture. So I found that uh, absolutely you know, froth worthy, you know, like I just, I just loved operating, you know, at that, at that highest tier, but, but importantly, as I've reiterated, you know, fully resourced and, and, um, given the assets, you know, it's just, yeah, it's incredible. Hey, so you touched, you, you mentioned something I want to touch on here. You said you, you kind of had this right hand man. I think it was Jared who was helping you get familiar with the SOPs. You put your own spin on this from whatever sport you want to choose, but I, I'm trying to envision somebody like a pro going from one sporting team to another. I would I would imagine you could be dropped in even with the US tier one element and operate SOP wise. Is it really that different from what you guys were doing that you have it takes a few days to pick up this new whatever it is scheme that they're running? Yeah, no, it, it's it's pretty similar. It's just some terminology things. And, and there's just some, um, you know, very small, like, idiosyncrasies. Um, sometimes, depending what component of the U.S. you're from, I'd need an interpreter. <laughs> this is where you picked up your accent right here. Like, seriously, some guys, you know, be like, hey, man, they'd be like, some guys would understand it, like, clearly. And then other guys would be like, fuck, man, can you get an interpreter for that guy? Like, I have got no fucking idea dear what he's telling me to do so and you know this turned you know into, you know get some pretty some funny scenarios in in some combat moments because you'll be just like look get out of the way i'll do it myself um but yeah like it, it pretty well dovetailed in there, there were components 
and I'll say this carefully because I've got uh, the utmost respect for the range of regiments. Um, you know, there, there were some uh, components uh, in in the range of platoon uh, that uh, you know I would say w- would not uh, meet the mark uh, of our unit, um, but they were always very new or junior guys. Um, so. You know, to put that into perspective, but certainly, you know, at that NCO level, to so the guys that have had a couple of runs on the board, um, you know, I, I will put it this way. It's certainly in a positive way. It definitely changed my opinion of the Rangers. Um, we'd later uh, set up an exchange with them, but at that stage, two commando regiment had, had very little to do with the Rangers. Um, but um, components of our hierarchy was saying that, you know, that's the unit we should be aligned to, which we didn't really understand. Um, and importantly to note, so that's what not misconstrued, is most of the Australians' um, picture, including mine, of the Ranger regiments at that time, um, was it just, you know, an up- upskilled infantry unit. And, you know, as a lot of people I assume would agree, because I won't speak for people's thoughts, but my opinion, as a lot of others did, was based, which which kind of hurt the Ranger Regiment, I think, um, off the Black Hawk Down portrayal. Um, you know, where, you know, they were good when they were told what to do in a gunfight and to do this and do that, but, you know, they're, um, you know, to be on self, self uh, you know, autopilot mode themselves or to operate as individuals or without command or, or, you know, to be given a mission and go forth type thing um, in an extremely complex environment where that everything can change so rapidly and, can consistently continue to change. You know, I think in that they're portrayed, you know, that, um, yeah, they, they weren't portrayed well. You know what I'm trying to say. So I, I certainly developed a lot more respect for them um, and saw how, you know, that they were operating in an environment that was, you know, quite superior. Um, you know, even though, um, you know, they would do, they would primarily do two or probably three job role functions primarily, which was the RRD component. So they had the the uh, reconnaissance um, detachment that was, you know, doing, you know, sort of more of the higher end stuff and doing the recon uh, specific, not just for, important to note, not just for the Ranger Regiment. They were also doing that for the um, for the dev group component there. Um, and then they would do missions unto their own. And then they would do missions where they were primarily blocks and or cordons and or uh, QRF for a uh, tier one, as in a dev group um, lead component. And that element that was there at the time, or the element, sorry, that I went into was uh, a gold squadron uh, element, um, which, um, as you know, the, the resulting um, you know, accident, there's only, you know, there's literally only about five or six of us um, left alive. Through uh, a couple of other things and that and that main accident. So H, you you had mentioned your crash. Can we talk about what that one is in 06? Yeah. So um, uh, we uh, we we went out on a uh, mission um, one night. Uh, it was in um, you know that can or off from the Kandahar region. Um, and and the intel was was that you know it would be you know. Uh, something that would be relatively opposed. Um, I, I can't remember the specific names of the um, high-value targets, but there was a couple of them um, in a compound of interest, and um, we were doing an offset. So the um, you know for the for the listeners of non-military ilk, the offsets where you know or the, there's a couple of the different variations of it, but particularly what happened that night was the um, the dev group component. Uh, was offset several kilometres away and would walk in um, and then uh, once they were more or less in and on the target, the um, uh, range element was to land on the target, um, when I say on the target, within 100 metres, um, and they were to set up blocking forces. So once you know they went noisy, as in that they'd initiated, um, that those blocking elements would be brought immediately in um, to uh, you know, ensure that things didn't go um, south and that the situation was contained, contained and controlled. Um, and that particular night, I was with the um, with the Ranger element um, that came in. Um, so we landed. Um, and, you know, I can remember hearing you know all the goings on of the infill because it took some time. 
uh, of walking the guys you know, directly onto target and and all the, um, uh, the the assets that get used to do that in regards to you know blocking assets and other surveillance assets etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, anyway, what happened? Um, so everything on the target. There was a couple of skirmishes uh, where we were in some heavy contact in some blocking elements. Uh, I think it was just to the south of the target. Um, and after those uh, were taken care of, um, and and the target had basically been wrapped up, so they finished the um, the um, sensitive site ex- exploitation uh, SSC as it's referred to, and we got the word to evacuate, which we were all going out on the same jets. And what happened? Um, so the two forty uh, sevens have come in, and they were offset. Um, so basically side by side, but, you know, when I say offset, you know, slightly, one slightly forward of the other um, and pretty well on top of the target. Like, you know, the, the closest target wall wouldn't have been, you know, 60, 70 metres away. And um, as I later found out, because it's important to tell this piece first, is um, there's a absolute key fundamental person um, that's up in uh, one of the air assets. And I can't remember which variation, it, it almost doesn't matter, but he is linking and tying in, syncing and coordinating like everything, all the air assets um, that are talking, coordinating um, uh, together. I think he might've been called air rider or something. Is that a call sign? If that brings familiar. But anyway, um, so this person, um, because of, how how long uh, we'd been you know the mission had been going for and the importance of having you know them 100% on board but for somewhere just as we were getting extracted because like I said this is essential to explain well how the hell did that happen um, there was a handover takeover there, there, was, there was basically something happened where there was a void of minutes and again it's almost unexplainable how this would happen at that level. Um, and I only know all this because, um, as you'll find out, because of the significance of this operation, um, there was a, um, quite an extensive um, in-person after-action report with the whole task force and the generals um, back at Bagel um, a week or so later. Anyway, so um, both these birds have come in. Um, we're starting to uh, load up. And just as um, I'm getting on, I just happened to be one of the last on. I think I was actually the last on. Um, the um, basically the sky lit up with um, your know, medium and heavy machine gun traces coming over those top of those blades, and those arcs were like almost interlocked. Um, and from an operator perspective, you know, there's no other word for it. Straight away, I was just like, oh fuck, like. Yeah, this is not good. And because of the level I was operating at, I also immediately was thinking, like, you know what, like what's going on here? You know, we had spectra gunships, we had this, we had that, you know, we had fast movers out on the bloody loop out here. Like, you know, we had everything. Um so um and again, retrospectively, what I found out, because then we were sitting on the ground for a period of time. So what was happening is they're trying to work out Look, what's going on? As in, you know, what's what's on station? Why isn't it being hit? Um, you know, etc. So there was a, a very quick, well, it seemed like long. It may have been thirty seconds or a minute of coordination going. That they would both take off at once. Um, both of them had four and a half mini guns. Um, so that you know you'd have one, two, three. What's that? Four, eight, eight mini guns. Um, you know, churning um, and. Plus, they then by then I think vectored the uh, Spectre um, gunship um, onto it. I won't, I won't go into the details of the capability of that if you just want to hit Google. Uh, but an extremely, extremely capable, capable um, platform. Anyway, um, so we both took off together, and you just hear the guns like, you know, minis, and just everything just getting lit up. Um, and you know, I've been in helicopters a thousand times, so I knew you know we were on full power. Um, which didn't mean it was an essentially exceptionally accelerated takeoff. I just knew that was all that that jet had um, at you know that altitude, at that weight, at that humidity, at that temperature, and everything else. And um, after we got up, uh, you know, up, you know, I don't know how high, you know, a good couple hundred feet probably. As in, I thought you know we might be out of our way. 
We then um, kicked out because you could feel the aircraft getting hit with some small arms, or not necessarily feel it. I, I say that, and I've said that before. I, I think the actual first thing I felt I could see trace, but we'd kicked out some of the little um, the portholes, which push out under force, um, and there were some of us trying to fire um, out of those. Um, and, and I'd also remember on one occasion I was firing um, off one of the guns or out of the porthole at the back or the back ramp. Um, and again, uh, I don't apologize for detail here because the next day we did a hot extraction. And I think, and I'm just being really honest here, and this happens with combat, is I think in between that extraction, with specifically what I did in that Chinook, and this is where I don't want to like someone replace another recording go, oh, you're telling shit. But what happened with that particular extraction that night and what happened with the extraction the next day, because they were both relatively hot and the duress and everything at the time, I think there's things that may have happened there but happened here and vice versa. So um, hopefully that makes sense and you, you get my point. Um, but the next distinct thing I can remember um, is um, you know an explosion near the jet. Uh, and I just remember, you know, a flash of light. And um, for any of those people who haven't been under night vision goggles before, you know, night vision goggles intensify light. So, um, you know, any flashes of light, are, you know, extremely um, acknowledged by the, the process of the night vision goggles. And then more so later, you know, when there's little things that were incorporated with technology into cutouts and stuff like this. But anyway, you get the point. So there's a large flash of light. Um, and then immediately, uh, almost after that, uh, um, so which was on the port side to the left hand side as the uh, jets going forward, I remember feeling and hearing another explosion, which later on, um, you know, we worked out and learnt that that was a RPG airburst. Um, after this point in time, um, the, there was a distinct, um, uh, I can only describe it as a uh, like a screaming hydraulic sort of noise the motion of the jet had become unstable and um you, you just you just knew after being in jets a long time of a rough ride and this jet ain't operating well there's a lot of vibration um uh, basically we knew or i knew at that point in time um that we'd been hit by something uh, and that we're going to crash so um there's lots of things um, running through my mind um, and uh, to, to be honest you know I was, I was trying to sort of I was pretty well sticking to you know instinctive things in my training at that time like I said I was right to the rear of the jet um, and because of the profiles we run you know we don't sit down and put seat belts on which is also probably worthy of mentioning you know there's a center line running down the um, floorboards um, which goes through a lot of the um, the D-rings, etc., cetera, and, and it's looped around them, and that's that tubular tape, that 3,000-pound tape. Um, so we have a strop coming off a, um, a special belt around our waist that's, you know, connected to that, and that that, that really just stops us flying around the aircraft. Like any, anything with any Gs, it'd snap you back in half. It's not, it's not a healthy restraint. It's just a restraint. Um, so then um, I remember looking at that, and then... Um, Whilst these thoughts are happening, the uh, jet is progressively flying worse um, and just starting to drift side to side a bit. And, you know, I could feel us going down, but we're not falling out of the sky, as in the rotors are still working, the jets are still working. Um, and then um, I just remember taking a knee because uh, I had no idea at that stage um, what the impact was going to be like or how or when or where. Um, so I just took a knee. Um, Stu when I look back when I say stupidly, probably sillyly, because of my um, training as in the um, helicopter escape training and crash training that we do in Australia, um, we have a special knife. You know, we carry a few knives, but this particular knife, um, you know, it's SOP2 carry it, and it's a Spyderco Rescue 93 millimeter because there's a little bull nose. So it's a special rescue knife and cut through anything. And generally have that under that zip pocket or Velcro pocket on our calf here because it's – you know, if you're seated or caught up, you, you know, you might be able to access it better. Anyway, I um, I remember pulling that out thinking, okay, if I crash and I get tangled up, I'll have that out now ready, which I just think now yeah, it's a stupid thing to do because um, it's just, just going to fly around or cut me up. Um, but anyway, I remember taking a knee, grabbing that, 
and then um and then frankly I just I just started to say goodbye to I was um, married at the time and got a family. Um and I just started to say goodbye to people. Uh I don't um you know, I'm not an extremely religious person or, or, or anything like that. I don't go to church, but you know, I was at that point in time I'll be honest, I was praying for everything. And then say goodbye to people and then um it wasn't uh it wasn't long after that that we hit the dirt. And again, retrospectively, because it was a hard landing, like a very hard landing. And I know in aviation terms, hard landing is an, is a term. Um, so I'm not using it in that term. I'm saying it was a fucking hard landing. But we, uh, I'm not saying that we crashed into the earth and exploded in a fire because we didn't. And what happened, um, and, and those that know uh, um, the Chinook layout, you know, and the struts and the wheels and without getting into all of that, but compared the, the standoff i guess and compared to other jets you know it could probably handle a little bit more and i don't know whether that's factual it's just the way that it appears um but i certainly developed a um very healthy level of respect for that frame um and then when so two things happened when when we were swaying around the moments before we landed we landed perfectly right if that makes sense so we weren't in an upwards or a downwards sway and I'm moving my hand around here for those people that, that can't see it. But basically, you know, the jet landed how it was supposed to land. And that's really important to note because if it landed on on its side, then the result would have been completely different. Um, so we were very lucky in that aspect. I later found out that one of the pilots uh, was one of the ones involved um, back in the Tora Bora incident. Was it Roberts Ridge, Ryan? Um he was one of the surviving pilots of one of the Chinook instances there. And he was then the chief. So the way the SO crews are done, they had to put a third person in the cockpit. Um, so you have the two persons forward and I'm no aviation expert, but you know, I, I believe he was there to help offer extra control or whatever. You might be able to state that better, Ryan. Um, and then, um, so that happened. So we had him, we swung, we landed as good as you could land. And it was in um, a field of like corn or maize or something. So it was quite high. So it was a soft field as opposed to the side of a mountain. So I think those three things saved a lot of people's lives, like a lot of people's lives. And you know, I don't know many people who can talk about helicopter crashes uh, in combat like that, where they're literally shot out of the sky. Um, so, um, you know, that's a, that's a near and dear component, I guess, to my heart and my subsequent career. And just you know, my mindset and a few things. So then after that, um, I remember after we landed, quickly going to cut my strop, um, and realizing I didn't have to cut it, so I preserved it. Um, and then I ran straight off the back ramp, noting I'm right near the back of the ramp. And then literally, as soon as I got off, I was like, you know, because I'm fine, and that's sort of hit in my head because I'm ready to fight. But then I've like turned straight around. And, gone back into the jet, you know, to make sure, you know, everything's okay. And I remember going through, you know, there's a couple of people roughed up, but there was no one had um, considerable injuries, um, which was just amazing, as in we didn't even have any gunshot wounds. And later we counted, we had 37 um, uh, gunshot strikes on that jet, let alone the explosions. And Sorry, that was an extraction jet. We didn't count that jet. It was detonated. Um, and I remember running back through to the cockpit, and I got to the um, cockpit and the guys, um, as you know, you know, you have your weapons sort of more strapped in or not in a, you know, heavily accessible thing and they're getting their stuff together. And I was like, are you guys right? And, you know, just yelling out, like, is everyone right? You're good. Does anyone need a hand? And trying to look around. Um, and when I say look around, you know, again, you know, we were on goggles, so you've got um, well, 60 degrees technically of vision or less. Um so, you know, you're doing a lot of pivoting with your heads and, and, and trying to, you know, gain as much situational awareness as I can as to, you know, what the status and, uh, you know, if anyone needs any help or something about to catch fire or explode or anything like that. So a lot going on basically in my mind. Um, and uh, I remember saying to those guys, and um, I can't remember which one it was, one of the chiefs or, or whatever, warrant officers, and I said, you guys right? And he goes, yeah, we're right. We've done our job. It's your job now to look after us. <laughs> As in, like, he's like, I got you on the ground. <laughs> he's like, now you, now make sure we're not going to get killed. And I sort of, I remember literally saying that. And I was like, it's so, like, sort of movie scene and cool how he said it. I was like, I oh, fucking got you, man. Like, we're, we're good. 
Um, anyway, we got off, um, so got everyone out um, and, and literally just cordoned the aircraft. Um, and then um, because I wasn't in command um, and there was a guy, a senior sergeant there, uh, nicknamed Charlie, I'll just call him Charlie. And I remember him trying to, you know, um, you know, get things um, organised and communicate and you know, reassure people. Obviously, there's a lot of traffic happening this time. I mean, a, a bird just dropped out of the sky or a fallen angel, as it's called. Um, so um, what happened then uh, was those um, or a couple of things. So you can hear the Spectre gunship um, now, you know, hooking in in, um, in on the several positions. When I say hooking in, you know, firing numerous types of ordnance into um, a couple of different positions not far from us. Um, and what also occurred shortly thereafter, and we've pushed out an immediate perimeter around the jet because um, at that stage, you know, the priority is to just, you know, preserve that asset um, and ourselves and uh, to get situational awareness in regards to any enemy and et cetera, you're not really thinking about recovery or this or that or anything yet. Um, and then it was all, it was, it was coming up. So this is very now early in the morning. So it wasn't daylight yet, but we were on, you know, that, that sort of earlier twilight period, I guess. Um, or, or that was fast approaching. Um, and I remember then there was a couple of skirmishes we had. So uh, those elements had, had, had come into the um, crash jet. So we fought off those couple of skirmishes a few times. Um, and then I remember because they got in, and you, you'd appreciate this with your background, Ryan, they got in so much fucking shit over this. But I can remember him standing there in the, in, the, in the big room we did AR in a few weeks ago. So what happened then, and for the listeners, the, the, a lot of these assets aren't allowed to be seen of a daytime. Like we literally can't use them of a daytime. Like a Spectre gunship can't be used, and this that can't be used, and that's how they keep you know them secretive and um, you know basically you know, keep them as ace cards up their sleeves, for want of a better term. Um, but I can remember you on the radio, you know, like jets were bingoed and Winchestered, and again, for the listeners, you know, they're out of fuel and they're out of munitions, and the um, our partner. Our brother, um, um, Chinook, that came in. And remember, it's got troops on it. So it isn't a gunship. It's come in and, like, flipped, like, quite down low and around us and flipped on its side. And it's just Winchestered everything, at, 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 you know, anything that was approaching us. And now I can remember because that was in, like, it, I could see it with the naked eye. So it was, you know, probably on first light or twilight or whatever. Um, and I remember, um, you know, it was very, it was very bravo, but it was also commendable of him as in um, in the AAR, a, um, the general made a point or, or the, one of the head ops guys probably because the general was kind of chairing it all. Um, you know, he's like, and, you know, that, that uh, the decision for that Chinook to go near the crash site and to, you know, use itself as a fire ship. And, you know, that guy stood up, man, and to his credit, he's like, hey, sir, you know, we had guys on the ground and if I had to do that again, I'd do it and, you know, and he gave this spiel. It was all pretty, you know, but he, um, you know, when there was a moment there and I, I might have missed up the order a little bit where we didn't have anything or there was confusion and because he could literally, he was flying by sight as opposed to um, using, um, you know, any, um, a, any um, you, know, you know, electronics or, or anything, any other sensors basically. Um, sensors is the right word. So he's just flying by, by sight and, he could see where we were and obviously could see something happening. Um, so, you know, flew over, dropped down and, um, yeah, and sort of let rip. And um, but he got a kick in the ass for that. And, you know, so I can remember the general saying, well, that ain't your decision to make, you know, and uh, whatnot. And he's like, well, you know, but it was all handled quite well. Um, and later on, we were pretty thankful for him because I think, you know, again, he helped us out a lot. Um, and then, yeah, if you cut forward, yeah, definitely. And if you cut forward a um, cut forward a couple of hours, um, we basically moved. Uh, got told we're going to get um, recovered. What was happening behind the scenes? Um, again, not that we knew, but I picked up that level of detail later. Was they were very concerned, um, you know, about doing a recovery, you know, in in such a hostile area. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the Americans are, are quite versed. Um, with you know losing jets and the the other thing which was extremely relevant at the time was it was only excuse me it was only in um 
and apologies again for the time frame, in um, 2005. So it was only less than a year earlier um, that we had, uh, or that the, the task force uh, had the element with the um, seals and um, that the subsequent movie was made out of where they lost, you know, not, yeah. Where So if you've seen the movie Lone Survivor, I'm talking about that um, incident. Uh, Red Wings. Yeah, Operation Red Wings. Um, so that operation was quite fresh in everyone's mind. Um, and again, you know, it, it was just behind the scenes was, okay, we need to know to get them out. But more so what the, we were always going to get out, you know, we were always going to look after us. And that may sound really obvious, but what I mean, what they're trying to prioritise was, you know, and it's a reality which I'm quite comfortable with, is that, you know, that jet's worth 20-something million dollars or whatever it's worth, um, as in the um, MHs, you know, a, a, a quite, you know, a, a significant asset. Um, and, the you know, that's what the deliberation and the time where we were like, hey, what's going on? Um, that's what, you know, what's happening behind the scenes. And yeah, you know, much to their credit. And again, this is you know where I developed a um, you know already said a lot of respect for U.S. forces and stuff, but you can see now where it's, it's become quite personal for me. Um, the decision that was made was uh, we're going to destroy the jet. We're not going to mess around with it. We're not going to try and get it out. We're not going to try and put in more guys in to surround it to save twenty million dollars. Uh, we're going to write the jet off and um, and get the boys out. So how it happened, um, once we knew that, we were ordered to move, you know, a couple hundred metres away um, because they put an actual strike on it, and uh, which was quite spectacular, um, you know, with the secondary blasts and stuff, as you can imagine. And we were, like I said, I don't know, five, six hundred metres away, one far away. So what happened was as um, we moved off the crash jet over to an extraction point we were given, um, once we were there, um, which – was more of an isolated type spot. Like there was a compound wall near us and we had to like eventually move out from that. Anyway, um, so we got into a heavy tick there. So that extraction when it occurred and like, man, I can still see, and this will sound exaggerative. And I saw like, you know, I flew with those guys for months and you know, I've done exchanges with, you know, on other tours and done other inserts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I tell you what, that 47, when that bird came in and extracted us, I can remember it come over, there was this palm tree, it clipped it, and it was flying like almost, it wasn't flying direct at us, it was at an angle, but it was coming towards us, if you know what I mean. And then it seemed to like just turn literally on a dime and just drop. And I just don't know how it maintained, sustained the different elements of power. I'm no aviator, but you know, I've been them enough. And, and maybe my vision of it you know, is somewhat exaggerated. But I can just remember when that thing came in, the way it flared and turned around and landed right on us. And we were all firing our weapons at that time. And everything coming out of it was firing. And there was other assets now on stations firing. And um, I can remember us running on board. I was carrying a large container full of, I think, some heap of, um, you used to call them speed balls, you know, like full of ammo and, and, and stuff off one of the back of the jets that we carried on. And sorry that I took off the other jet in case obviously in case we needed more ammunition or supplies or anything. And um, I remember running towards the back ramp and, you know, we were literally stopping and propping on our knees. That, that back door gun is firing, the other the front door gun is firing. And um, and that's what I was saying before because they counted the holes at Kandahar. That jet still got hit, they had 37 strikes in it. Um, and, um, yeah, we got on board and we we're, like, you know, firing out of the back ramp, out of the, off the back port. Oh, it was, it was maddest. Um, and I remember just to cut forward a bit. So, yeah, so that was the extraction. And um, and I remember um, when we landed at Kandahar, there was a, um, a big, big, quite experienced sergeant major from a certain group that I'll refer to as Randy. And I can remember Randy. So we landed and all the, uh, the some of the um, senior and key people uh, from the task force had flown up to Kandahar uh, for, you know, probably to greet us after the extraction on it. It was a pretty significant, you know, 24 hours. So they were standing there on the flight line and um, and they brought up a, um, a C-17 to get us all on and get us back, like immediately. 
anyway, um, so there's a C17 there, the hierarchies. And I remember Randy walking over to me. I've literally just come off the back of the ramp and just like, just literally shaking my head. Because the jet that came in us to pick us up had the um, had the um, elements of the dev group on it. Um, anyway, I remember him walking up to me and he's like, hey, H, is that your first Hilo crash? I'm like, yeah, and I'm I don't want that to be my last. He's like, welcome to Hilo Crash. Said, yeah, I've had three and starts telling me all about them. I'm like, fuck, man. <laughs> okay. I, I, don't, I don't ever want to be in a position where I'm greeting people from Hilo Crashes bragging about how many Hilo Crashes I've had, you know. <laughs> With the way Randy was talking about it, he's like, I can't believe you haven't had a Hilo Crash yet. That's your first Hilo Crash. It's like, welcome to JSOC. <laughs> I'm like, fuck this shit. You know, it was, just, it was just one of those moments, man. You know, he was a big, burly fella, you know, that old half lit cigar hanging out with real, you know, movie character, you know, just large life, uh, absolute empathetic individual, though, and uh, utmost respect for, you know, he had quite a distinguished career and, you know, very reputable gentleman. But, um, yeah, I never forget, man, him just walking straight up to me. He's like, Is that your first Hilo crash? <laughs> yeah, and then he just, it, between while we're walking back, right, you know, I'm still I'm not in shock, but, you know, I'm still like, fuck, I'm alive. You know, I'm looking back at this thing you know, with holes in it. They're like, shut it down, you know, and, and you know, here's Randy, you know, telling me about this time in Iraq where he's sitting on some ammo and, you know, they got crashed and the ammo didn't go off. And I can only remember Skerrick, so what he's telling me, I'm just like, man, I, I like, I, I want to hear your story, maybe over a scotch or something one night, but right now I'm, I'm just dealing with my helo crash, not your helo crashes. It was, it, was, it, was, it was classic, man. But yeah, that was a, that was a big day. It was a big day, mate. It was a good. I mean, at the end of the day, it was a good day. H, listen, I know I, I've taken you longer than than I promised. I do want to ask though, since you're talking about this, you, you mentioned you were praying on impact. Did you come out of this event like when you when Randy stopped talking to you, and you're you're kind of like by yourself for a second? What was going through your head? Were were you just like, hey, I'm thankful to be alive? Did you feel like I got a new lease on life? What was happening? I, th I think firstly and foremostly, I think, and I'm just trying to actually think, but I think, you know, to be hand on heart, that was probably my first, you know, like I've had some other close calls, but probably nothing that close. So I think that's important to note and because I'll get to that point because they accumulate. Well, if you hang around long enough doing our business, they do. Um, and I think I certainly had an immediate different mindset on life, um, on being, you know, grateful. It didn't take the wind out of my sails. You know, I had some moments certainly when I come home, but at the time it didn't. I was actually even more, you know, motivated, invigorated, confident, you know, that, you know, hey, I can survive this, you know, we can get recovered, you know, I can go through all of that. You know, we launched out of MOP again the next night. So, you know, sitting in that schnook again the next night, you can imagine, and you're coming in like, hey, boys, it's looking a bit hot. You know, you're like, fucking how hot, man? Like, shoot down hot or land safe hot? <laughs> anyway, um, but, yeah, I, I, was, I was certainly, I think I was a bit more, even though I said all those things there about confidence and, and things, I, I, I certainly um, – it grounded me a lot, pardon the pun. Um, you know, I think I, I, I think I just instantly had a bit more gratitude to life. I was a bit more humble, um, and, and and I think I think those feelings from that event actually grew and developed because, as you would appreciate, and those persons listening who have been, you know, in in those um, heavy combat orientated units doesn't need to be special ops, but you know aviators and whatnot but who were in heavily combat orientated um units in whatever job role function um you know these things have a cumulative effect as as, as i say and you know i remember then you know later on i guess that's when you know i think you get to a point and it wasn't the reason that i discharged or anything but you get to a point and it's like you know i i, I think i've got to be fast approaching you know i don't believe in luck but running out of you know lives here um, you know, there's a mate of mine, you know, that I follow and, um, and, you know, he's, he's, um, handling his eight lives. So, you know, and so, and he's, he's, he's discharged now. It's like, you know, it's like we're, you know, we're done, but, um, no, it, it, I, it didn't make me, you know, religious or, or anything like that. I, I don't not believe. Um, I just, you know, I, 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 
yeah, I, I, like I, I believe in life. I know it's starting to sound a bit heavy. It's the gratitude, though. You know, we've got this purpose. I believe that things happen for a reason. Um, you know, I believe in mathematics, as in, you know, rather than saying, oh, it's good luck. I'm like, there's, there's no luck involved. There's no luck whatsoever. You know, bullets didn't hit the right areas. Rockets didn't hit the right areas. The jet is made to do this. The pilots are trained to do that. We're trained to do this. You know, the aircraft limits, you know, the contingency loading figures, you know, all these things, yeah, they're all factors. So when people say oh, there's luck, it's like, well, would you say I was unlucky if we were shot down and died? No, because the rocket hit the right spot, it exploded and we all died, which sadly, you know, happened um, in, in later years with Gold Squadron and, and, and some other elements. But, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I know, uh, I apologise, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there about luck and stuff because it's just an important point I often make, you know, I'm, yeah, I literally, and I used to say that saying, and and I literally, if anybody would say that, or even if I'm walking out the door and they're like, "Hey, good luck," I'd turn around and stop and I'd go, and I'd look them dead in the eye, and go, "There's no fucking luck in this game. There is no luck involved." So listen, one day, we, I know you, you, we have a book someday coming out, right? When that happens, I I hope you'll let me do round two because I I think there's just so much to cover. I want to get you out of here. Can we talk about what you're doing now? What you're focused on? You got. Seven Horses, which I kind of want to understand the handle there and what that company represents and what it means to you and whatever else you're working on now. Yeah. So um, so Seven Horses Co. Uh, is my business name uh, and my handle. Um, as Ryan said, so you know, on Twitter and Instagram, um, there's a Facebook element, but it's just something I've barred. It's not active. Um, Seven Horses is, is you know quite uh, near and dear and deep to me and probably a little bit philosophical. Philosophical. I, I personally, with my brand, so the business at the moment, the business is, you know, will turn into something, but, you know, it's a brand and, and at this stage, you know, it's, it's about things that I do, um, you know, in veteran advocacy, um, in coaching, speaking and other things. Um, I'll come back to where it's going. I'll um, first talk about, you know, where, it, where or how it started. Um, so after I got out, you know, I had a period of time, you know, I was still working quite intensely and, you know, worked for some amazing different organisations and people and stuff all over the world. And then um, uh, I realised I, I actually wasn't well and needed that deep reset. So I went in the middle of Australia on a um, station. Now, for the listeners, um, to, to reset myself and to get away from everything, and, and this, well, I'll, I'll make this fastly relevant, is... Um, First of all, so the size of stations in the middle of Australia for US listeners to give us a perspective, this stuff is, this place is um, 350,000 acres attached to 2.5 million acres. Um, so you can work that out. So, you know, the, and that's not unusual. Um, so the properties in Australia are absolutely massive beyond a scale that you may be able to, um, um, you know, put, put into perspective. So you had a lot of free space. You're extremely remote is my point. Um, now, on that station, you had a lot of jobs and responsibilities to do. Now, but one of them, you know, um, there was a lot of Brumbies on there, um, you know, which you call um, your wild horse term. What is it again? Um, oh, it'll, it'll come to me. No, no, no. You've got another term in the US. It's a different term you use. Um I know it, it's just escaped me for a second. Anyway, so in Australia, you know, they're Brumbies, and they're, um, um, there was this group of seven of them, um, and, you know, they're quite quite wild, um, you know, as in they're unapproachable, unrideable, et cetera. And there was seven has always been, you know, one of my favourite numbers, my lucky number, and it's just, it's just been that number for me. Um, so then, you know, the... Uh, next minute I'm sitting there, you know, resetting my soul for several months in the most, you know, isolated, um, you know, and also quite, you know, hospitable part of, or inhospitable part of Australia. And um, every couple of days I'd pull up the uh, Toyota and trailer and, you know, feed these Brumbies. Uh, and there was a drought, so there's no feed around. And, um, and that was the time I'd sort of just sit and just really like tune out and um, it just became this, you know, point in time or, or point in my weekly cycle or whatever. And I found it extremely therapeutic and healthy for me, you know, my mindset and, and just, you know, being around those type of animals, um, you know, is just exceptionally spirited. 
And then, um, so then I started to look into, you know, seven horses. There's some, uh, um, noting what I said earlier about not being significantly religious, but there's actually some quite biblical uh, historical things about seven horses and some other, um, you know, ancient, um, you know, empires about, you know, this painting of seven horses. And, and so it just sort of grew from there. Um, and then more importantly, I wanted a term that wasn't, you know, the warrior this or the warrior that or the this or the that, you know. Um, you know, like a lot of friends who start something and, you know, you just look at it. So I wanted a business name which would be inquisitive uh, but be distinctly isolated or would stand on its own. Um, and then when we built the symbology, um, which I know the listeners can't um, see, but, you know, it has some parallel lines. Um, the H in the horses, H is, you know, my commonly known name is in bold. It has a little chevron above it, you know, which is um, symbology for shield, shelter, protection. Um, you know, and the parallel lines, you know, um, show us, you know, strengths and how we can be going in the same paths. Um, you know, so a lot went into the in the colouring, the grey, um, as in, you know, the world, um, you know, we like to have this black and white. And I don't believe in it. Um, that there, there is, you know, so much grey in the world um, and that things, um, too many people nowadays uh, tend, uh, you know, to preference putting things in a box or a hole or, you know, well, what's your decision on this, you know, and that it's okay to not know something. It's okay to not make a decision for a period of time as much as I profess that, you know, you know we need to be forward thinking, we need to be this. I'm just saying that there are times uh, when it's in fact best you know, to, um, you know, to uh, let things, you know, sit um, or to also understand that something doesn't need to go in a particular box and that it can sit in a grey area and to also exercise um, our mindset to be in that grey space, um, you know, as in working our grey matter more and the whole psychological thing. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a bit to it all. Um, but that's how um, the seven horses handle um, came about. Um, and to move further on and to close out, um, Ryan, the uh, last part was, you know, what am I doing now? Um, yes, we're working uh, towards some uh, proposals. So I've, I've had an actual book deal signed, which I um, then folded, and that was a deliberate decision, and I'm glad I did that. It was not long after I got out of the military. Um and I think my mindset then uh, wouldn't have produced a great book. I'm sure it would have been a good book. Um, but I think where I'm at now and the way I look at and view things and with subsequent experiences and with a lot of retrospective healthy thought or healthy retrospective thought, um, I think now you know uh, uh, the book that will come out will be um, good. So we're still going through a proposal phase. And I won't say much more about um, that, but other than to promise, promise the world. <laughs> As I've been asked many times, that there's going to be a book on a shelf one day. Um, and then the main component that I'm doing near and dear to my heart is I want to create, which I'm on the final stages of now, and it's taken a lot of behind-the-scenes work, I want to create you know, a space. So if you think, uh, and I don't want to put a label on it, but to, to, to get you in the ballpark, to use an American term, if you think of um, you know, like a ranch, uh, if you think of like a veterans retreat or for emergency services, but a place also that you don't, there doesn't need to be anything wrong with you, that you can just come and, and be in a space and do as little as you want or as much as you want. So um, working with an investor and a good business partner of mine, um, we've been working a lot on that um, uh, to create that. And what that needs to, um, because the fundamental component of it is it needs to be an operating business. Um, so it'll reside around horses and cattle. Um and the reason for that is because there's a lot of science behind the interactions with people, with animals, and there's a lot of science behind doing basic laborious work again in the outdoors. There's a lot of science, um, you know, behind you know just stripping yourself away. So by providing that space where things need to be done, as in to operate, you know, um, you know that those operations, as in those business operations, and that just creates you know, organic, fundamental daily jobs. And then within those jobs, um, you know, at spikes, you know, there are peaks and troughs of work um, through, you know, cattle cycles, et cetera, you know, we'll, 
bring people into that environment and they can do as little as they want there or, or as much as they want there. Um, but importantly, you know, through an extremely, you know, inclusive, inclusive, um, you know, uh, operating and social space in regards to how we you know, eat together and communicate and sit around at a night time um, together and basically just, you know, debrief. Um, and then within that, I'll insert some other professional components on specific programs and courses which will then be more targeted and designed to certain um, people. And then we just want to then kind of open it up. You know, it could be, um, you know, uh, groups of children, um, you know, that are, or adolescents, you know, that have had um, unfair or disadvantaged upbringings and might not be traveling too well in the world. So just really, you know, that, that's my juice is really giving back in that space. And um, uh, like I said, I'm I not in a position, you know, financially to be able to get that off the ground. Um, so that's where the investors have come in, um, and, you know, we want to get them in and, um, you know, get things moving along and, uh, we're getting very close. Um, so there's an offer on a parcel of land at the moment. Um, so when I say we're close, so, um, we should have some word in the next few days. That's great. What, what an initiative. I love it. So H, thanks so much for the time. I, if you don't mind, there's two questions I ask everybody. They're pretty quick. I'll fire them off to you if you don't mind, and then we'll we'll let you get out of here. Uh, the first is when you were going into combat, was there something that you carried with you that had sentimental value or that somebody had given to you that was meaningful? Yes, it's easy to answer. Uh, at the time, I had my uh, wedding ring, which is uh, uh, it's still exactly intact, and I had that um, designed by a para rigger um, cause I never wore it. Um, so I had it stitched into a piece of, um, Kajura into a, like a little envelope and then bar tacked together. And then that was then bar tacked on a piece of paracord. And that was, uh, tied around my, um, neck. Um, and, uh, that, uh, I, there's nowhere, um, that I ever went, um, without that. So, um, that was, that was my little good luck charm. Very cool. Okay. And then last one here, and you you almost mentioned it during the discussion, but you know, going back on on all these years that you're looking at um, in the rearview mirror, all the sacrifice, the crashes, the near death experiences, and then what you overcame, would you go back and do all that again? Um, you know, the things I've I've regretted, yes, but you know, the shorter answer is, you know, would I go back and do it again? Most definitely. Uh, there's no question about it, and. Um, and you know, I'll also furthermore offer up to anybody, you know, that, you know, if you're if you're considering a life in the military, um, you know, it's I think it's an extremely worthwhile life, um, and it provides a great foundation for the rest of your life, whether you want to make it a career or uh, a stepping stone in personal development. Um, but I'll leave you with this: is that it is a selfless service. Uh, I think too many people now think that someone or something owes himself. If you join the military. You're serving and it's selfless and you need to remind yourself of that. Love it. Thanks for the time, H. We'll have all of the uh, ways to find you, the initiative and what's going on in the description here. And I hope uh, when the book comes out, you might let me do a round two where we dig into some of the other efforts and some of your other experiences. Thanks for listening to this combat story. As we wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you to those in the combat story community who have taken a few minutes out of your busy lives to not just listen to these stories, but also leave positive and supportive comments on Apple and YouTube. Here are some of the comments that caught my eye this week. Our first comment is from Matt, who left a five-star review. Must listen. This podcast lets you hear about the stories of many of our nation's warfighters. These stories are unbelievable and will give you great insight into what war was like. Thank you. Hey, Matt, thanks very much for leaving that. I couldn't agree with you more. This is why I started doing these. I just knew people had these incredible stories from any deployment they're on. It's really fascinating uh, how much goes on in just a year. But I, I really wanted to get these out there. I'm glad that it's resonating with you. Thanks for taking the time to leave that. It means a lot. Our second comment comes from Troy Leach. It's a great, it's a great one. It's long. So uh, this is on the part one to Dan Pronk uh, interview on YouTube. Best interview ever. Can't wait for part two. What a story. I won't, but if you condensed his life into dot points, wow. He won't get the spotlight like some, but man, pretty damn amazing. Okay, I'll do a short version. Chubby kid, no friends, average student. Becomes a triathlete, certainly of a reasonable standard. 
does a science degree, joins the army, becomes a doctor, seven years in training total, four plus three, passes the SAS selection course. FYI, guys, this is the selection course only. Training begins after that. Does four tours in Afghanistan as an MD embedded in the frontline operations as an operator. So now we await part two. I'm emboldened to make my bed tomorrow morning. Troy, that's awesome. Really appreciate you leaving that. Just makes me smile reading it. And part two is is great as well. Uh, Dan's books, especially the average 70 kilogram dickhead is, is worth a read. It's got some hilarious gems in it. Uh, just about him growing up, cars, his wife, so like some gr- some interesting decisions he made. But I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I love talking to him as well. And there have been some other comments people made about Dan and Mark Wales, just how humble they are. I don't know if it's just being Australian uh, and good people, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. Thanks for taking the time to leave that, Troy. I know you're leaving a lot here. Uh, thank you very much for that time. Stay safe, y'all.